Now, the, the title of our message this morning, as we look at the first 14 verses of Galatians chapter 3, the title of our message is Faith or Works. Faith or works. And so with that, let's just jump right in. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer many things in vain, if indeed this was in vain? Did he who supplies the Spirit to you and works of miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed among with, oh, I'm sorry, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it, it, it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. So that Christ Jesus, uh, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, that you gave your life, your son, God in human form for us that we might live. And so by faith, we have received that. We've received you into our life and we've given you free reign and control of every aspect of our life. So Lord, we surrender every detail of our life the known and the unknown. We surrender everything into your hands because you are the Lord of our life. You not only saved us of our sins, but you are leading us through our life. So Lord, we pray that you continue to lead us. You would continue to direct us and that you would speak to us this morning through your word. We pray this now in Jesus' name and everyone say it. Amen. It wasn't a hearty amen, but I did hear at least one out there. So... Um, <laughs> You do know we serve coffee. I'm just Anyway, uh, you know, I think I told you before about the Sunday school teacher who, who uh, asked the kids in her class. She said, now, kids, listen, if, if, if I sold my house and I sold my car and I gave all of that money to the church, would that make me good enough to go to heaven? And all the kids responded in unison and they said, no. And she said, okay, well, well, if I feed the poor every day and I take care of widows and I take care of orphans, would that make me good enough to go to heaven? And again, they shouted and said, no. And so she said, well, then, then what do you need to do to go to heaven? And one boy stood up and said, well, you got to die to go to heaven. <laughs> Well, in a sense, that that's the very question that the Apostle Paul's talking about this morning here in Galatians chapter 3. He, he, he brings up the question, basically, you know, that, that when you were saved, were you saved by works or were you saved by faith? You know, uh, do, do you work your way to heaven or do you believe your way to heaven? You know, there are many people who, who think that, that, you know, that there's something that you need to do to make yourself good enough to go to heaven. So, you know, maybe you need to go to church. Maybe you need to get baptized. You need to take communion. You need to pray this certain kind of prayer, have this certain kind of ritual, do this thing or that thing. And, and, and we tend to think that as long as our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, we're going to be good enough to go to heaven. And so that's the question that the Apostle Paul is dealing with this morning. And to answer it, he's using Abraham as an illustration. Now, as he uses Abraham as an illustration, he's going to show us three truths this morning. In fact, if you're taking notes, let me give them to you now. Truth number one that he shows us is that Abraham himself was saved by faith. That's truth number one. We'll put it up on the screen. Abraham was saved by faith. Truth number two is that anyone can be saved by faith. If Abraham himself was saved by faith, well, then anyone can be saved by faith. And then truth number three is that faith has always been the requirement for salvation. Whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, 
faith has always been the requirement for salvation. So these are the three truths that the Apostle Paul is going to give us here in Galatians chapter 3 this morning. But first, as we go back to the first five verses, Paul broaches the subject. He, he brings up the question of, of, you know, when you were saved, were, were you saved by works or were you saved by faith? And so Paul says, and again in verse 1, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works of miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? I don't know about you, but but I love that that Paul kind of starts this section with a little bit of snark. I mean, I got to tell you, I love myself a degree of snarkiness, okay? So he starts off a little snarky. You know, he's like, he's like, you know, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I love the way the, the, J, the J.B. Phillips translation captures this. It says in the J.B. Phillips translation, Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia, surely you can't be so idiotic. <laughs> A little bit of Gordon Ramsay, Chef Gordon Ramsay in that. Like one time I heard Chef Gordon Ramsay ask somebody, Are you always this pathetic? I mean, how do you answer a question like that? I mean, no, not always. Uh, you know, or yeah, usually. I mean, you know, there's just no way out of that. You know, so, yeah, so he's like, you know, oh, foolish Galatians. Now that word foolish that Paul uses here, it's a word that means that, that, that you've stopped engaging your mind. It's a word that means that, that, that you've stopped thinking. And so in a sense, Paul's saying, listen, he's saying it's like you've stopped thinking for yourselves and you're allowing someone else to do the thinking for you. In fact, he even adds the word bewitched to it. He says, who has bewitched you? It literally could be translated, who's cast a spell on you? Who's mesmerized you? And so the idea is that, you know, that there are some public speakers that are, that are so captivating and, 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 and just, you know, so inspiring that, that it's almost as if the audience is spellbound while they speak. In fact, it was said that, that Adolf Hitler uh, had this ability to just cast a spell on thousands of people while he was speaking publicly. He, they, they were just mystified by his speeches. And so in effect, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you know what, this, this group of Judaizers, he's saying, you know what, they're, they're great public speakers. In fact, they're so convincing and they're so captivating that people by the thousands are being spellbound to the point that they no longer think for themselves and they're letting the Judaizers do the thinking for them. And then in verse 2, he adds this. He says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, that's a rhetorical question. In other words, you know, the, the answer is in the question, kind of like a grilled cheese sandwich. The recipe is in the name, right? And so, you know, he, he, you know did, did you receive uh, the, the Spirit by faith or by works? Now, by the way, I don't know about you, but, but I've seen this, this pattern over and over again in, in many, many Christians. You know, this, this pattern where, you know, some Christians, they'll, they'll start off in the Spirit. You know, they, they start off with a simple relationship with Jesus, but then over time, they complicate it. Over time, they add this and they add that and, and, and they complicate it. You know, somebody comes along and, and tells them something. They're like, oh, tell me more. I want to hear more about that. And so the person they're talking to says, oh, yeah, if you really want to be spiritual, you've got to add this and you've got to do that and you've got to do these things. And so over the years, I've, I've seen well-intentioned Christians who, who do all sorts of things, like, like maybe, uh, you know, convert to Judaism, Messianic Judaism. You know, they, 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 you know, they, 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 they convert to becoming a Messianic Jew. Now listen, it, it's one thing when a Jewish person receives Jesus as their Savior, as their Messiah. That is a great thing. When a Jewish person gets saved and becomes a Christian, a Messianic Christian, Although the first time I went to Israel, we, we, we met some, some Jewish Christians there who did not call themselves Messianic Jews. They called themselves completed Jews. Why? They said, well, because they understood that Jesus was the one who completed and fulfilled all of the Old Testament. And so they saw themselves as completed Jews. Everything that they were taught from the Torah all pointed to Jesus, and now they're completed. They found what they were looking for. But, you know, it's a good thing when, when a Jewish person accepts Jesus as their Messiah. But, you know, it's something completely different when it's a Swedish American with blonde hair, blue eyes, and all of a sudden they think that, that they're going to somehow be more spiritual if they convert to Judaism, if they become a, a Messianic Jew. 
And, and so they, they kind of, you know, switch over. And, and you know, and uh, listen, let me say that, that you know, it, it, is, it is wonderful to study our Jewish roots as Christians, the Jewish roots of our faith. Listen, Jesus, our Savior, was Jewish. Our scriptures are Jewish. And so, you know, the more we get to know our Jewish roots as Christians, the the more we're going to understand our Christian faith. That's why week after week, I stand up here and I give you the culture, I give you the background, I give you the history, because it draws us deeper. But at the same time, you know, I've, I've met some who, who in their, their attempt to connect with their Jewish roots as Christians, it, it's, it's like they all of a sudden uh, put themselves under the burden of the law, the, the burden of the Jewish law. You know, they start keeping this custom and they start doing that. In fact, I remember years ago when I was in my 20s, be, be, before I was married, I was going to this home Bible study and there was another guy there just a little bit older than I was and all of a sudden he started getting into this sort of stuff. In fact, one time he told me when we were having uh, breakfast at Denny's and so to this day I don't eat at Denny's but you know, he, he told me at Denny's, he said, you know what? He says, he says, unless you obey all of the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. By the way, he had ham and bacon on his plate. Hypocrite, table five. Anyway, so, you know, but, you know, just, but, you know, unless you obey all the law of Moses, you cannot be saved, this guy said. And, and so, you know, by the way, isn't that the same thing that the, that the Judaizers were telling the Galatians? This is the same thing. Now, by the way, I've seen the same sort of thing happen with Calvinism. You know, I've seen, uh, you know, people you know, who've come from the worst backgrounds. And, and, and all of a sudden they go to church, they hear the gospel, and so they come forward for an altar call. They, they pray to receive Jesus, and all of a sudden they are so excited about Jesus, so on fire. And, and so they share the gospel with anyone and everyone who will listen. But then lo and behold, one day someone turns them on to the things of Calvinism. Things like, like predestination and, and, and limited atonement. And all of a sudden, they, they, they no longer share the gospel. It's just, they just want to argue with everybody. They just want to theologically pick fights with people. And, and it's like they no longer have this desire to share the gospel. Why? Because now they no longer believe that Jesus came to die for the whole world, but only for a few select, as, as, only for the so-called elect. And so, you know, we've seen this over and over again where, where people start with a simple relationship with Jesus and then they complicate it. They, 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 they start in the spirit, but then they try to perfect themselves in the flesh. And so now Paul, to deal with that, now uses Abraham as an illustration. And so uh, in, in verses 6 and 7, Paul, Paul tells him, Look, listen, even Abraham was saved by faith. And so in verse 6, he says, just as Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Now, it's interesting. In between verses 6 through 14, the Apostle Paul is, is going to quote the Old Testament like six different times. Six different times to, to show basically that, that the whole world, uh, and the Jew and the Gentile like the whole world, Jew and Gentile are saved by faith. It's not just the Jew, but it's the whole world. Even the Gentile are saved by faith. And I told you a few minutes ago in our introduction, Paul's going to show us three things. By way of review, he's going to show us, number one, that Abraham was saved by faith. That's what we're looking at now. Number two, anyone can be saved by faith. And number three, faith has always been the requirement for salvation. And so here now he's showing us that Abraham himself was saved by faith when he says in verse six, so then... Uh, those who are of the faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I'm sorry, that's not verse 6. Verse 6 in your Bible and my Bible actually says, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. This dyslexic moment brought to you by... Uh, you have to understand, the, the Jews, even to this day, the Jews pride themselves on being the sons of Abraham, being the sons of Abraham. You know, in the Bible, uh, the Bible calls Abraham the friend of God. And likewise, the Bible calls Abraham righteous. And so they, because they are the sons of Abraham, after all, see themselves as being the friend of God as well, and also see themselves as being righteous before God. It's like they believe that, that they've inherited Abraham's righteousness. Because he was righteous, and they're his sons, they're righteous as well. But for them, it, it, was, it was all about circumcision. Because you see, way back in Genesis chapter 17, 
God makes a covenant with Abraham. And then to seal the covenant, to close the deal, God tells Abraham to get circumcised. And that's what closed the covenant. That was a sign of their covenant relationship. And now, uh, as, as sons of Abraham, uh, they themselves, as descendants of Abraham, they themselves get circumcised as well. It was, it was their sign that they are the sons of Abraham. It's their sign that they are in a covenant with God. It's their sign that they are the Jewish people. But now Paul is quoting from the Old Testament to show them that, that, that Abraham was considered righteous not because he got circumcised. No, he, he was considered righteous because he, because he believed. It was hard for me to say that. Because he believed. Because he had faith. For example, in Genesis chapter 15. We read how, how Abraham is in the midst of this battle with several different kings, and, and, and Abraham wonders if he's going to make it out alive. And so God assures Abraham that he will make it out alive. And he tells Abraham, Abraham, I am your shield and exceedingly great reward. And then in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Then he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And so in other words, God was saying, listen, Abraham, not only are you going to make it out of this situation alive, not only are you going to survive this situation, but you're going to live long enough to have a son. In fact, your descendants are going to be so many that you're actually going to be the father of an entire nation. And then on the heels of that, it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, that's the verse that the Apostle Paul is quoting here in verse 6. He believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, listen, by the way. When Abraham believed God and he was made righteous, you have to realize that at this point in context of the book of Genesis, he was not yet a Jew. He doesn't become a Jew until chapter 17. So what that means is, is that in Genesis chapter 15, he's still a pagan from the land of Ur of, of Canaan. And then 14 years later in Genesis chapter 17, that's when God makes a covenant with Abraham and Abraham gets circumcised. And so in other words, Abraham was not made righteous because he got circumcised. Abraham was righteous by faith. He, he, he believed God. He put his faith in God in Genesis chapter 15. And then 14 years later in Genesis chapter 17, he got circumcised. Think of it this way. Circumcision made him Jewish. Faith made him righteous. I'll say that again. Circumcision made him Jewish. It was his faith that made him righteous. And so... Paul's illustrating that Abraham was saved by faith. And now in verses 8 and 9, he continues as if to say, you know what? If Abraham himself was saved by faith, well, then anyone can be saved by faith. And so in verse 8, Paul says, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Now, in my Bible, I underlined this. Why? Because somebody might tell you that the gospel didn't get preached until the New Testament. Or somebody else might tell you that the gospel didn't get preached until the Apostle Paul came on the scene. That's not true. Because right here, the Apostle Paul himself just wrote, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Even before there were ever Jewish people, the gospel was preached to the, to the founder of the Jewish people. The gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. And then Paul says, saying, in you shall all nations be blessed. So then... Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So now when Paul says, in you, all the nations shall be blessed, he's quoting, that that's his second quote from the New Testament. I said there'll be six quotes. This is quote number two. He's quoting now from Genesis chapter 12, verse three. Genesis chapter 12, verse three. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, again, point one, Paul says, you know what, even Abraham was saved by, by faith, not by works. And in the same way, point two, if, if Abraham was saved by faith, anybody can be saved by faith. Not just the Jewish people, but the Gentiles as well. The whole world can be saved by faith. And so, in a sense, that passage, Genesis chapter 12, verse 13, that is sort of the Old Testament equivalent of John 3.16. That says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
It didn't say for God so loved the Jewish people. God so loved the entire world, Jew and non-Jew alike. Now, by the way, I bring this up because there is a fringe group in, in, in modern-day Christianity uh, that, that, that teaches a, a doctrine called hyper-dispensationalism. In fact, a little while ago, somebody uh, wrote me in and, and asked me that question. You know how in our e-bulletin, we have a little button that says, ask a pastor a question? And, and so they did. They clicked it and they said, what in the world is hyper-dispensationalism? So for whoever you are, here's your answer. And, and, and by the way, can I say that, that dispensationalism is a good thing, but hyper-dispensationalism is a very bad thing. They're not the same thing. And so what in the world is hyperdispensationalism? Well, I'm glad you asked. Hyperdispensationalism is this, is this doctrine that believes that, that basically the apostle Paul was the only apostle who actually preached the gospel. The, 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 the apostle Paul was the only one who preached that, that you're saved by grace and by faith alone. And then they would say that, that the apostles Peter and James and John and the rest of the apostles, they didn't preach the pure gospel. They preached a mixed gospel, a gospel that was a combination of grace plus the law. Grace plus works. Sounds a lot like the Judaizers that we've been talking about in the book of Galatians. And so they would say that, you know, the, the, the hyper-dispensationalists would say that, that in the Old Testament, people were saved by the law. They were saved by, by doing the works of the law. But in the New Testament, specifically under the Apostle Paul, people were saved by grace and by faith alone. But here's the thing. That is just not true. If you take the time to study the entire Bible, you're going to discover that through the entire Bible, through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, there's always only ever been one way to be saved, and that's always been by grace and faith. For example, Genesis chapter 6, we'll go back to the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah didn't get saved because of his works. Noah didn't get saved because he built an ark. He got saved because God had grace on Noah, and God in his grace told Noah that the judgment was coming. God in his grace told Noah to build an ark. Noah was, was saved by grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then the same way there's Abraham. We just got done talking about how, how the Bible says that Abraham was made righteous by his faith. And then there's, there's Isaac. God chose Isaac over Ishmael because of grace. And in the same way, there's Jacob. Now, Jacob, his name means heel catcher because he was always scheming and, and, and conniving and plotting. And, and yet, he was chosen over his brother Esau. And he was chosen because of grace. Listen, Jacob wasn't chosen because he was so wonderful. He wasn't chosen because he did all these righteous things. I just said he was a schemer. He was a conniver. He was chosen by grace. In fact, for that matter, the, the entire nation of Israel was chosen because of God's grace. You know, they, they were his chosen people. God, in his grace, chose to use the nation of Israel as, as his tool, as his instrument to communicate to the entire world who he was. And he chose them by grace. In fact, on one occasion, the, the Jewish people themselves even wondered out loud, you know, why in the world did God choose us? Out of all the people to choose, why did he choose us? And so God answers the question in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. It says, Then the, the Lord did not choose you and lavish his love on you because you were larger or greater than the other nations. We'll pause there. In other words, it wasn't because you're so wonderful and you did all these wonderful things. No, he goes on, he says, For you were the smallest of all nations. It was simply because the Lord loves you. Why did he choose them? Because he loves them. It was an act of grace. And in the same way, I'm here to tell you that God chose you because he loves you. Love the way Max Lucado put it. He said, listen, friends, God loves you. He's crazy about you. In fact, if God had a refrigerator in heaven, your picture would be on it. <laughs> and so just as Abraham was saved by grace, Paul is showing that anyone can be saved by grace. And that brings us to his third point, verses 10 through 14, where we see that faith has always been the requirement for salvation, Old Testament and New Testament alike. Verse 10, Paul says, 
Well, that was in the Greek, but let's look at it in English. Verse 10, he says, For all who rely on the works of the law under a curse, or I'm sorry, are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is, is not a faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ re- redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. So again, point number three, faith has always been the requirement of salvation. And so then Paul, to, to illustrate, now, it now has his third and his fourth quote from the Old Testament. So first of all, we go back to verse 10. At the end of verse 10, he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, he's quoting, and it says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Then after that, then at the end of verse 11, he then quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, saying, The righteous shall live by faith. Now let's deal with each of those. First of all, he quotes from Deuteronomy 26, uh, I'm sorry, 27, verse 26, and, and it, where it says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all of the things written in the book of the law and do them. So what's Paul's point by quoting that verse? Well, his point is that, you know what? The law doesn't bring a blessing. The law brings a curse. In other words, the law doesn't bless you. The law condemns you unless you are absolutely 100% perfect. But listen, if you're not 100% perfect, if you don't keep the, the, the law 100% perfect, 100% of the time, like 24-7, 365 days a year, every year of your life, if you mess up just one little tiny bit, well, then the law doesn't bless you. The law actually condemns you. You know, and sometimes you, you meet people who will say, well, you know, I, I try to live my life by the Ten Commandments. <laughs> well, how's that going for you? Because, you know, when you think about it, quite frankly, m- most people nowadays can't even tell you, can't even name what the Ten Commandments actually are, much less actually live by them. I mean, you don't even know what all Ten Commandments are. You know, but, but oh, I live by the Ten Commandments. Really, can you tell me, like, like five of them? Oh, I just, no, no, you know, so, you know, by the way, re- do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? In Matthew chapter 5, you know, Jesus, you know, you know, if somebody's claiming that, you know, they, you know they, they've never committed adultery, well, Jesus' response in, in Matthew chapter 5 would be, well, you know what? If you've ever lusted at, at a woman in your heart, well, then you're guilty of committing adultery in your heart. Or somebody else might say, well, you know, I, I'm basically a good person. You know, I haven't, like, you know, murdered anybody. Well, Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 5 is, well, you know what? If, if you've ever been angry with someone in your heart, then you're basically guilty of murder in your heart. Now, let me put this in a way that you might understand. If you've ever driven down I-25 in the middle of rush hour and somebody cut you off and then they gave you the little you know, gesture that said you're number one, but like with a different finger, not your index finger. You know, and, and in that moment, you, you might be you know, guilty of murder in your heart. Now, you know, and so, listen, most of us, we, we can't even name the Ten Commandments, much less live by them. But listen, if, if you think the Ten Commandments are hard to live by, are hard to actually keep, then listen to this. Did you know in the Bible there are much, much more than just Ten Commandments? In fact, those are just the top ten. In fact, in the first five books of the Bible, there are actually 613 commandments. We can't even name the top ten, let alone keep them, let alone keep 613 commandments. And so what, what, what Paul's basically saying is, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect person. There's no such thing as, as, a, as a perfect person who, uh, on the history of the earth, except for Jesus himself, who's ever kept 100% of all 613 commandments 100% of the time, 24-7, 365 days a year, every year of their life. There's, that, that kind of person doesn't exist. And so if, if you've broken even one of those 613 commandments, and you have, trust me, we, we like follow you. No, I'm kidding. But we, we, we know because we, none of us are perfect. We've broken even one of them. The law doesn't bless us. The law condemns us. And then after that, then, then Paul then quotes at the end of verse 11, he, he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, that the righteous shall live by faith. Now here we see, by the way, that even in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before the Apostle Paul was even born, 
Even in the Old Testament, we see that, 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 that keeping the law is not what makes you righteous. No, what makes you righteous is faith. The, 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 the righteous shall live by faith. And then after that, in verse 12, Paul continues, and he says, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. And so now he's quoting from, from uh, this is his fifth quote, he's quoting from Leviticus 18.5. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. And then after that, he, quote, he, he quotes one more scripture uh, at, at the very end when he says uh, that, that curses everyone who hangs on a tree. That's from Deuteronomy chapter uh, 21, verse 23. But, but what does he mean when he says that the law is not of faith, but rather the one who does them shall live by them? Well, what Paul's saying is that, you know what? The, the law doesn't ask you to put your faith in it. You see, the law doesn't ask you to believe. No, the law demands perfection. The law uh, d- demands that, that, that you, you have strict obedience, that you live strictly according to every jot and tittle, every detail of the law. And, and, and if, you, if you can successfully do that, well, then you're righteous. But if you can't, if you fail in just one little detail, then you're not righteous. The law doesn't bless you. The law condemns you. And some of you may remember an old poem Uh, It goes like this. It says, do this and live, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. A better word the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. You see, the gospel empowers us. The gospel enables us to actually do it. And so in the region of Galatia, keep in mind, Galatia was not a city. It's a region of cities that included Antioch, it included uh, Lystra and and uh, Poseidon and and, 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 uh, Poseidon. a bunch of other cities I can't remember right now, Derby, but, but it, it was a region of cities. And so in this region of cities known as the Galatian region, uh, there, there were like two different groups. Uh, on the one hand, there were the Judaizers who, who were basically saying, you know what, if you want God to accept you, well, then you've got you've to do enough good works to make you good enough for him to accept you. But then on the other hand was the Apostle Paul who said, you know what, there's no such thing as, as doing enough good works that would ever make God accept you. You, 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 you can't do enough good works. Because it says, he says it's not by your works, it's by your faith. God accepts you on the terms of faith. By the way, Martin Luther himself actually struggled with this. Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther the monk. Martin Luther, you know, struggled with this. He was an, a monk in the, in the Augustinian monastery, and, and, and he was very devout. In fact, in between his various studies, he would constantly flog himself with a whip uh, until he was black and blue and bloody. And and, and he did this to discipline his flesh. In fact, any time he had an impure thought of of like lust or anger or whatever it was, he would flog himself until he was black and blue and bloody. And and, in fact, he was so troubled by the idea that that sin or, or sinful thoughts could keep him from going to heaven that he would go to confession multiple times a day. To the point that the priest leading confession finally said to, said to him and said, Martin, either get out and, and, and go commit a sin actually worth confessing or stop coming here. <laughs> in fact, Luther was so worried uh, uh, about, about his sins keeping him from heaven that, that he, he made a trip to Rome. In the year of 1509, he, he went to, to Rome to the church of St. John Lateran, where they claimed, by the way, to have the very steps uh, to the judgment hall of Pontius Pilate. In fact, the, the custom even to this day is to crawl up those steps on your knees uh, as, as a way to show how devoted you are to God and as a way to, to discipline your flesh. Because everybody who crawls up on those steps on their knees, by the time they're done, they have bloodied knees. So Luther is climbing up those steps and, 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 and he's going up and he's going up and, and he says in, 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 there was this moment where it was as if the Spirit of God reminded him of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 that the righteous shall live by faith. And so in that moment, Luther got up, he, 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 he got off those steps, went back to his monastery in Germany, and he studied that passage, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And he studied Galatians chapter 3. And that's when he realized that he could be righteous before God, not by righteous works, not by punishing his flesh, but by faith. But you see, many of us, a lot like Luther, you know, we, we feel like you know, we, we need to do enough good works so that God will think we're good enough to accept us. But listen, the Bible says in, in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the Bible says, our righteousness are, are like filthy rags. So what that's saying is that, you know what? 
all our good works, I mean, everything you've ever done, all, all the religious rituals you've ever tried to keep, the prayers, the communion, the baptisms, you know, all the times you were, you were good to people, you, you paid it forward, uh, you helped the poor, all, all those good things that you've ever done, hoping that it's going to give you a right standing before God, Isaiah is saying, you know what, none of those things are good enough. Every good thing you've ever done, when God looks at it, all it looks like to him are filthy rags. In other words, none of those things will make us righteous. The only thing that will make us righteous is faith. Habakkuk said in in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the righteous shall live by faith. And so listen, in the end, there's coming a day when when you and I are going to stand before our maker and and the question that's going to be asked is is not, did did your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds? The question that's going to be asked is, did you believe? Can your faith be credited to you as righteousness? The Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Likewise, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it says, but when the kindness and the love of our God and Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we thank you that, that you saved us. And Jesus, we thank you that, it was, that you took our place, that, that you died Because of grace, you died for us. And there's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can perform to to make you accept us. You accept us if we have faith, if we trust, if we believe in you. So listen, maybe you're here this morning as we pray. Uh, Maybe you're watching online or maybe later you're listening on the radio. And maybe you're the kind of person that the whole reason you come to church is because you feel like you have to. You come to church or you watch online because you, you feel like, you know, if, if, if I go to church and if I do this and if I do that, well, then, then maybe God will accept me. No, your righteousness is as filthy rags to him. There's only one way that he accepts you, and it's by faith. It's always been that way, and it's never going to not be that way. It's by faith. If you have faith, if you believe that that in his grace, he saved you. If by faith, you ask him to come into your life, you ask him to be the Lord of your life, to change you from the inside out. And if by faith, you you dedicate yourself that you're going to live for him and no longer for yourself, then your faith is credited to you as righteousness. So if that's you, if, if, if you need to, to, to step out in faith, then pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Change me from the inside out. I no longer want to be in control of my life. I surrender my life to you. You are my Lord. And I will live this day from this day forward for you and for you alone. In Jesus' name. Why don't we stand and sing one more song to our Lord.